Well back in June 2022, I made a video reviewing the old in-city fleet of Transport for Wales. At the end of it, I promised that in a few months' time, I would make another video reviewing the new fleet, that being the Class 197s and Mark IVs. As a bit of a side note, I struggle to believe that that was less than two years ago. I don't mean to brag or anything, but I've gotten a lot better at making videos since then. It pains me to watch that. Anyway, I might be a little late, but I think I now have a good enough feel for the trains to make a proper review of them. In 2018, Transport for Wales, the Welsh equivalent of the Department for Transport, launched an ambitious new programme to try and transform the railways of Wales. It would see the Transport for Wales brand applied to trains, and, eventually, public ownership. But the most radical plans were for huge investments, with electrification and conversion of lines to metro operation, a replacement of almost every train in the country, and considerable improvements to service frequency and quality. This wasn't just confined to the South Wales metro either. Wales' intercity and regional networks would receive upgrades too, with a large fleet of new Class 197 DMUs to provide consistency on regional lines, and Mark IV coaches to truly bring the Cardiff to Manchester services up to intercity standards. But do they really deliver? Let's start with the Class 197s. The Class 197s are part of the CAF Civity range, and were assembled in Wales, Newport specifically, which is a promising start. They're formed of either two or three coaches, which is pretty short, but they do have end gangways so can easily be coupled up together. They certainly look the part, but the Transport for Wales livery doesn't suit them quite as well as, say, the West Midlands one. Nonetheless, they still look modern. When boarding the train, however, there is an extremely large step between the platform and vehicle, inconvenient for everyone and unnavigable for many. A slight problem I have with the doors is that there's a small door not in use light that illuminates when the doors are locked. This can be quite confusing. Signs like this are unexpected unless the door is broken and will never open, but they're being used when everything's operating correctly. The vestibules are nice aesthetically, but is it really appropriate to have one third, two third doors on an intercity or regional train? They lose an awful lot of heat in the winter and can be quite noisy. Besides, they encourage standing when there may well be empty seats. Speaking of those seats, well, they are exceptional. For a modern train, the level of padding is superb, and it does prove that comfort is still achievable. The seat is essentially a heavily modified Fainzer Sophia, the same as those fitted to the IETs. In my opinion, the increased padding fixes most of the Sophia's issues, as I find it actually rather well shaped, but I know that quite a lot of other people disagree. Some of the three car sets have a section of standard plus accommodation, which features 2 plus 1 seating of the same style as the IETs and Transpennine Express Class 397s. They're rather comfortable, especially when reclined, but unfortunately there's no change to the internal decor, so it doesn't really look that good. Still, I'm very fond of the idea of Standard Plus. The upgrades are competitively priced, and it's nice to have the option to get a larger seat if you want one. It's not first class, you don't get any food off the trolley, but it is a nice little extra. Unfortunately, the rest of the interior completely fails to match the quality of the seat. Window alignment is laughably poor, and a huge section of every single unit is taken up for this massive catering area. Now I'm a big supporter of on-train catering, but not like this. Does every single two-coach train really need this much? To make matters worse, it's that coach that also has the massive universal toilet. The result of this is that on a two-coach train, you often have one coach full and standing as there are hardly any seats, and another with plenty of empty space. The catering cupboards can't even be replaced with extra seating at a future date, as they're structurally part of the vehicles. But at least on some of the more recent three-car sets, they've been given these vinyls that improve the ambience a little. The toilets also feel poorly planned. Whilst the actual toilet design is alright, the positioning leaves a lot to be desired. On a two-coach train, there is only one universally accessible toilet, and on a three-coach, there's one universal and one standard. This is a notable decrease from the Class 197's predecessors, the Classes 158 and 175, which both had two toilets and a two-coach train. As I'm sure you can imagine, halving the number of toilets means the one that does remain has its tanks fill up much quicker, and they're quite regularly locked out of service for this reason. As if that wasn't bad enough, the universal toilets are constantly beset with problems and malfunctions, meaning they're often locked out too. On a two-coach train this is terrible, as there's no toilet at all, but on a three-coach train this means three coaches of passengers are using just one standard toilet. But that's enough about toilets. 
Sadly, the class 196's excellent lighting hasn't made its way over to the 197's. It's too late to redo the lighting so that it uses the roof as a diffuser, but they do appear to be fitted with spotlights. The class 196's always have their spotlights turned on, which improves the ambience somewhat, but the 197's almost never do. I don't know why this is, but I don't think it should be the case. The mock-ups of the class 197 had their spotlights illuminated, and it looked really good. This would be a simple and cheap way to make the ambience just that little bit more stylish. But this is sort of missing the forest for the trees. The purpose of the class 197's was to hugely increase the amount of rolling stock available, thus increasing capacity and allowing for new and more frequent services. It didn't really matter if the trains weren't perfect, they just had to fulfil the new timetables and they'd be a massive improvement from what came before. But they haven't proven particularly capable at doing even that. The 197's have had considerable reliability problems from introduction. Be it safety system faults automatically applying the emergency brake in service, or wheel slip creating dangerous flats, the trains have struggled to operate even their booked work. Ordinarily, it could just be dismissed as teething problems, but they've been in service for over a year now, and this really isn't good enough. I do think that things will get better, but it's certainly not promising when brand new trains are breaking down. All in all, they're not fantastic trains. At a fundamental level, was it really the best idea to purchase pure diesel trains that are unlikely to be modifiable? The recent government announcement of the electrification of the North Wales coastal line is more or less useless for Transport for Wales. They won't have any trains capable of operating on electric power up there. The 197s also won't be able to take advantage of the electrification between Newport and Cardiff, and eventually, one day, Swansea. If, instead, a large fleet of high-spec Stadler flirts had been purchased, they could easily be retrofitted to run on overhead wires if the need arose. There would also be more in common with the Class 231s and 756s, leading to a simpler fleet. And that's not even mentioning the improved build quality, better staff experience, or level boarding. Now, I do appreciate that whilst they'd probably be a better long-term investment, flirts would have cost a lot up front. So, Class 197s might be a necessary evil to enable a transformation of the Welsh network. Ultimately, I don't know yet. But, whilst they are better than class 150s or 153s, the 197s are certainly nothing special. Transport for Wales initially purchased a small fleet of three Mark IV rakes. These would be four coaches long and operate the premier Gerald service between Cardiff and Holyhead, subsidised by the Welsh Government. However, after Grand Central withdrew their plans to operate a service between London Euston and Blackpool North, Transport for Wales seized the opportunity to purchase the now out-of-work Mark IV sets that Grand Central were planning to use. The idea was that, when lengthened to five coaches, they'd operate half of the Cardiff to Manchester services as well. This will provide a proper intercity operation, with high levels of service including first class, full meals and a buffet. Or at least, that was the plan. Reliability of the Class 67 locomotives that haul the Mark IVs has been awful. Power failures are frequent, and there have been many instances of engines just giving up whilst in service. As a result, many of the Mark IVs diagrams are covered by other rolling stock, usually Class 158s or 197s. This is pretty bad from a trust point of view. Passengers who purchase first-class tickets and don't get a first-class seat are naturally going to feel let down, and whilst they can claim a partial refund, it's an unnecessary hassle. This is such a shame, as when they're working, the Mark IVs are superb trains to travel on. Even though there are plenty of mismatched liveries, they look very impressive, and signal a clear uplift in the standard of service. The internal decor is excellent in both the XLNER sets and X Grand Central ones. That said though, it would be nice if the latter had curtains in first class. It's just a subtle difference, but it does improve the atmosphere. As I said in the old video, the toilets and vestibules do feel dingy and outdated, so could probably do with a refurbishment, but it's not exactly urgent. Perhaps what sets the Mark IVs apart, though, is the customer service offered to their passengers. Trains are very well staffed, with each set containing a driver, guard, first-class host, chef and buffet attendant, and sometimes even more. To be honest, I don't think they need both a first-class host and a buffet attendant, but they seem to be able to support it, so fair enough. All these crew members do make an interesting sight when a Mark IV is swapped for a two-coach 197. It's not uncommon for a small army to be escorting the trolley down the aisles. Anyway, on the Mark IVs you can have some rather sumptuous meals, from breakfast to dinner. You do have to be in first class on the main menu, and the cost of food is additional to your ticket. But I think this works fine. Plenty of people seem willing to pay extra on long journeys. Standard class passengers don't go hungry either. 
with light meals available from the buffet, like jacket potatoes or soup. Sure, it's not quite the roast chicken supreme or baked portobello mushroom of first class, but it's much better than what you'll find on most other operators, and it's all chef-cooked, too. Unfortunately, performance is considerably worse than on the 197s. The trains accelerate slowly, and aren't allowed to use the higher speed limits that multiple units like the Civities can. They do run up to 110 miles an hour between Crewe and Manchester, but it's not enough to outweigh the slower journeys elsewhere. Once the Welsh Marchers line goes up to two trains an hour, this won't be such a problem. Stops at smaller stations can be cut out and left to the new Holyhead or Liverpool services, and this will allow journey times to be sped up somewhat. Still, I would go further. LNER retains a small fleet of eight Mark IV sets, and these will be coming off lease within the next few years. Transport for Wales could purchase them, giving them a fleet of 15 or 16 sets, depending on whether they get this spare one sitting at Bristol sorted out. This would enable every service between Manchester and Cardiff to be a Mark IV, improving consistency, and would potentially even allow for extensions to Swansea too. This should also improve punctuality, as trains wouldn't have to wait to come out of Cardiff Canton Depot as they do now. There may even be enough sets left over to put more of the Cardiff to Holyhead services in the hands of Mark IVs again. That would be lovely. The Class 197's freed up as a result of this could go to replacing the uh, temperamental Class 230's on the Wrexham to Bidston line and the Class 153's on the Heart of Wales. This would simplify TFW's fleet, whilst also improving the passenger experience for a huge number of people. Now, this plan does face the issue of locomotives. The Class 67's are troublesome to say the least, and there wouldn't be enough of them to operate 16 sets, but they will have to be replaced at some point, and it would make sense to do it whilst enlarging the fleet. An ideal candidate for the replacement would be a high-powered version of the Class 93. Because they're bi-mode, they could also operate off the overhead wires where applicable, saving a lot of diesel fuel and emissions. However, I sound like I've been sponsored by Stadler here, so um, other bi-mode locomotives are available. Well, the only other ones, the Class 88s, are also made by Stadler, so uh, it's a bit of a tricky situation here. With that, I shall leave you there. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and please comment if you have any thoughts yourself. I'll see you next time, and goodbye. Thank you.